been, uh, as, as uh, was mentioned earlier uh, this morning, it's been another long week in uh, the McLean household uh, as we closed on our house this past Tuesday and removed pretty much all of our stuff um, in the same week. Uh, we took three separate loads uh, from our apartment into our new house, and all three times we ended up unloading in the dark. Our neighbors probably think we are lunatics, um, and soon they'll probably confirm that, hey, we are lunatics. Um, uh, but a big thank you uh, to Mark and Brian and Jen for helping us carry uh, the larger furniture that uh, my lovely, adorable, sweet, beautiful wife, but yet very weak wife, uh, was not able to help me carry. Um, and thanks to Danny as well uh, for watching Trouble uh, for those couple of hours, a.k.a. Ezra. Um, AKA our trouble son, uh, but adorable. Um, but today, uh, so big thank you to all of you guys uh, who helped out this past week. Um, but today uh, we are going to continue our series on the fruits of the Spirit. Um, we're kind of getting close to the conclusion of the series. There's nine different fruits. We spent a week introducing uh, the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, I was sick one week and John filled in. So we've kind of been talking, we're going to end up talking about uh, the fruit of the Spirit 11 weeks. And we're almost at the end here and talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, a word of encouragement for maybe some of you guys who are tired of talking about the uh, fruit of the Spirit. But they're, they're, they're vital. They're very important. And, and I thought it was important and necessary for us to spend this time Delving into each of the individual fruits of the Spirit, as I mentioned before, that the fruit of the Spirit has seemed to be lacking um, throughout the world, throughout this country, throughout the state of Ohio, throughout Clark County and Champaign County as well. Um, and so I wanted to highlight uh, the fruits of the Spirit and, and so that we can be aware of it and we can know the importance of it, as the fruit of the Spirit is what proves that we have God's Holy Spirit living within us. I think I said that just about every week. So uh, if by the end of this series you're not able to say that, I have failed somehow. Um, but yes, the fruit of the Spirit is what proves that we have the Holy Spirit living within us. And we should expect to see our fruits in our life continue to naturally grow. Just like you would expect to see an apple on a tree continue to naturally grow. So we should expect to see our love. We should expect to see joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness. We should expect to see all these things naturally grow in our lives if we seek God first and foremost. If you aren't finding that you are naturally growing in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and goodness, and so forth, that can be a warning sign to you that, hey, maybe uh, I'm not on the right track. Now, if you are one who does find that you are, are growing in these different fruits, then, hey, that can be an encouragement to you that, hey, you are on the right track because you are proving that you have God's holy and precious spirits living within you. And so thus far, we, we talk about love, we talk about joy, we talk about peace and patience and kindness, and today we are talking about goodness. Now, you'll notice that a, a lot of these different nine fruit of the Spirit, they're, they're very closely related, a, a couple of these different fruit. And goodness, I think, is a fruit that is very closely related to a couple of the different uh, fruit that we've talked about thus far. I, I think that it uh, has many similarities uh, to love, and even more, I think it has a lot of similarities with kindness. Um, so to differentiate between love and kindness and goodness, um, in the English language, we define good as that which is morally right. I mean, there, there's a couple of different definitions of good. We, we can talk about like a good sandwich or that was a good movie. Um, but the, the, the good that we're talking about as far as the fruit of the Spirit, goodness, we're talking about that which is morally right. And, and the Greek word for good follows along the, the same train of thought there as well. That goodness is about being morally right, making the morally correct decisions within our life. And, and so again, related but different. And, and we want to make that differentiation uh, this morning between goodness and some of the other fruits of the Spirit. So it's about making the correct decision, the morally right decision in our life. Studies suggest that uh, adults make about 35,000 decisions in one single day. 
that, that is a lot of decisions that, that we make in, in our daily life. 35,000 about, that, that, that's the rough ballpark of how many decisions you make on a daily basis. Now, a, a wide majority of, of these decisions that we make in our life are, are very small decisions that don't have much importance. That's not wrong or right, and it's not good or bad, but decisions like, what am I going to eat for breakfast? Am I going to have a bowl of cereal, a banana, or a granola bar? Or uh, how long am I going to take the shower for? Am I going to soak in the warm water for, water for an extra minute? Or am I going to get going with my day? Or am I going to um, turn, turn right here on this street or continue straight? There, there's so many little, little decisions that we make in our life, and that's really the, the wide majority of the decisions that we make in, in our life. However, there are a lot of decisions left on a daily basis that are either good or bad or right or wrong. And today we're, we're, we're going to be focusing on making the morally right, the morally correct decision this morning. And to help us do that this morning, uh, Jesus tells a brilliant parable in Luke chapter 10. So if you have your Bibles, you can open up to Luke chapter 10, as it deals with the fruits of goodness and, and, and making uh, the right, the morally right decision in our life. Um, again, a parable is just like a short little story. It's not something that actually literally happened, but it's a short story that Jesus would often share with those around him to make a point. And so here he tells a parable of the good Samaritan. This is probably one of, if not the most well-known parable um, that Jesus has taught, um, even though it's only found here in uh, the book of Luke. So the parable of the good Samaritan. So we'll be reading uh, chap Luke chapter 10 verses 25 all the way down to 37. And so it starts off in, in, in verse 25. It says, And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, this, this is Jesus. This is Jesus having an interaction with a lawyer. And Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. So here we have a lawyer. Now, a lawyer, he would have been a pretty bright guy who, who would have um, been pretty good at holding discussions, holding arguments, holding debate. But here, this lawyer, the, the, the smart fella, he is trying to stump Jesus. Time and time again, we, we read throughout the four Gospels, time and time again, Different people, different lawyers, different uh, groups of the Jews, they ask questions to Jesus, not with a pure intention, but they ask him with the intention of trying to stump him. That say, hey, you don't know it all. Hey, you aren't the Messiah. Hey, you aren't the Christ. And so that's kind of the purpose of this lawyer. He, he, he's probably tired of hearing all these people rave on and on about uh, the, this Jesus of Nazareth. And so he says, you know what? I, myself, am going to put him to the test because I'm this smart lawyer who knows everything. And so this lawyer says, hey, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And now in a very Jesus way about it, he, he doesn't go and, and directly answer uh, the question. Instead, Jesus answers with another question. And Jesus says, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And so here Jesus is asking, what is written in the scriptures? What's written in the Old Testament? What's written in the law of Moses? And the lawyer, apparently he, he knew the scripture pretty well, and he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. So here Jesus asks, well, what is written in the law? In response to how do we uh, attain eternal life, Jesus asks, well, what is written in the law? And again, this, this lawyer, he, he would have known the scripture pretty well because he knew the importance. This is quoted from uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4, and, and verse 5, the Shema, uh, a scripture that we've talked about time and time again. The most important passage to the Jews in the Old Testament. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. 
and you shall love the Lord with basically everything that you have. And, and so the lawyer knew that this was important. This kind of summed up the whole law. And he included as well, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so Jesus says, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. And so there, the, the lawyer, he was seeking a question. He was trying to stump Jesus. He was asking, how do I attain eternal life? Jesus, in, in, in kind of the, the, the shifty way that, that he answers questions, he actually has him answer the question by asking him another question. It's a, it's a bit confusing there. Um, but we can end the story right there. The lawyer got the answer that he was looking for. He answered it. He answered himself, and, and all is good, life is good. If you do this, then Jesus says you will live. You will have eternal life if you love God with all that you have and if you love your neighbor as yourself. Basically, the whole law can be summed up into these two different commandments. And so we can end this story there in verses 25 and 28, but it does not end there. But he, the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? See, now this may seem like an innocent question uh, on the surface, but this is not the question that the lawyer needed to be asking right here. This is a limit-seeking question. Here, the, the, this lawyer is aiming to identify the non-neighbor. He's aiming to identify the person that is not his neighbor so that he does not have to love as himself. So he's creating a limit-seeking question. And so in other words, the lawyer wanted to know who were the people that he did not have to love. <laughs> that was the total wrong question to be asking. But this is the question that the lawyer had, as we can see, he did not have the most pure intentions. And so Jesus, with this question, well, who is my neighbor that I actually love as myself? Jesus answers this question with the parable of the Good Samaritan. And starting in verse 30, Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. So here in, in this parable of the Good Samaritan, we're, we're going to break it down a bit here. Um, so here, G again, this is a parable. This is not something that, that actually happened, but Jesus is telling a story for a very specific purpose. And we see that that very specific purpose is found in verse 29 when the lawyer asks, and who is my neighbor? Basically, who am I to love as myself? And so Jesus tells this story, he tells this parable to this lawyer. He says that there was a man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now I find it uh, very interesting uh, that in this parable, kind of in this uh, made-up story, kind of, Jesus includes a specific location. This is actually the only parable that Jesus taught that had a specific, a specific location. And we can ask, well, why would Jesus include the specific location that this man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho? And I think that maybe part of it is because that this road to Jericho was notoriously unsafe. You, you did not want to travel down this road by yourself. It, it was set up so that one could easily get ambushed. And, and basically, you know, we, we kind of have those same rules. You know, you, you basically shouldn't be walking um, in, in downtown Springfield late at night by yourself. That's just not smart. That's an unwise decision to make. That's a foolish decision to make. 
But here this man, all by himself, he was walking down this road to Jericho, which was notoriously unsafe. And well, what did he get? He got what was coming his way. He, he was tricked, he was beaten, and he was left half dead. And so here I, I think Jesus is kind of uh, giving this specific detail about the, the, this person going from Jerusalem to Jericho to kind of, you know, make us feel a, a little less compassionate for this man. You know, what was this guy thinking? What did he have so important that he needed to go down this road by himself, which was notoriously unsafe at that time? But as the, this person was walking down that road, and after he got beaten and, and stripped and robbed from it, and, and he was left half dead on the side of the road, thank goodness a priest walked down the road. Thank goodness a, a priest was walking down the road and was able to see this man lying on the ground left for dead. A, 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 a godly man, a priest, someone who was really <coughs> to do God's work and, and, and to minister to God's people. Of all people, I think we want a priest or, or maybe a doctor, but a priest is someone that, that you would surely trust to take care of this person. And so this priest, he, he walks by, he takes a look at this man lying on the side of the road, and what does the priest do? He makes a decision and he decides that, hey, I'm just going to go walk right by this man left for dead on the side of the road. So a bummer, a bummer that this priest walked by. He could have saved this man, but instead he just turned a blind eye. He decided not to do the right thing here and stop by and help him. So a bummer, but there's some good news. There is some good news. There's a second man that came walking down the road, and, and someone else was here to help. And it was a Levite this time around. Now, a, a Levite was one of the 12 tribes of Israel. It was a tribe of Israel that was designated specifically for God. So, so these are God's special people, the Levites. They, they uh, started at, after uh, the Passover when God freed the Israelites from Egypt. Um, he spared all the Israelites' firstborn sons. And so for kind of, uh, to make it even, God said, well, instead of taking all of your firstborn sons, I will take the tribe of Levi for myself to do my work. And so these Levites, they would have attended to the temple. A lot of these Levites, they would have been priests as well. So these in general, you would suppose, supposedly these are a godly group of people, the Levites. And so the second guy, supposedly godly person walks down the road and he sees this man beaten, left half for dead on the side of the road. And thank goodness that is not some other criminal who, who would come and try to finish him off. But it's this good man. And this Levite goes and he walks down the road and he sees the man lying down on the ground, left for dead. And what does he do? Right then in that moment, he makes a decision to turn a blind eye and to just keep on walking. Now we can't uh, know for certain uh, the reasoning behind why the, the priests and the Levites would not have stopped to help uh, the, this man lying on the road. But there, there, there's two likely possibilities. One is that the Levite and the priest, they wanted to remain clean. Uh, the law of Moses, they had very strict rules about being deemed unclean if you touched a dead body. And it makes perfect sense because uh, they, they wanted, God wanted to control the diseases and infections um, from, from the, the people who are deceased. And so they had these strict rules about not touching dead people. And so possibly, you know, possibly uh, they, they wanted to remain clean. They wanted to remain pure. Another possibility is that they were just indifferent. That they didn't care about this man. That obviously this man wasn't their brother, this man wasn't their friend, this man wasn't their family. And so they didn't care. That, that, that's a possibility. They, they might have had too much to do, too much on their schedule. They didn't want to take time out of their day to help this man. So again, we can't know for certain the, the reasoning behind the decisions that the Levite and the priest made. But for whatever reason, both the priest and the Levite... Two supposedly godly people did not stop to help this poor man who had been beaten nearly to death. And so finally, a third man comes walking by. 
In this time, it is a Samaritan man. And now for the, for the sake of this parable, we really have to understand who a Samaritan is. And, and to answer that, let, let's rewind a bit. About a thousand years before Jesus would be telling this parable, a Solomon was king over all of Israel. And now Solomon had a son, Rehoboam, who temporarily for a short time was king over the unified nation of Israel as well. But under Rehoboam's rule, the nation of Israel split into two. It splits into the ten northern tribes of Israel and into the two southern tribes of Judah. We've been talking a lot about that uh, in our latest Bible study and our youth group. Um, and so both were far from perfect. Both the ten northern tribes of Israel and the two southern tribes of Judah, they're both far from perfect. A lot of people fell far, far away from God. However, the, the nation of Judah was uh, less further away. They're closer to perfect than the people of Israel. Israel, they completely fell away from God, unfortunately. And so as, as punishment, the nation of Israel, they were taken captive by the Assyrians. And so as the, the Assyrians, a foreign nation, came in and, and conquered them, a lot of the Israelites, they were taken away as exiles. However, there remained uh, a few people who stayed in the land of Israel even after they were conquered by the Assyrians. And these people who, who stayed in Israel, they intermarried with, with the foreign nations. God strictly wanted the Israelites not to intermarry because these other people, they were big into child sacrifice, they were big into worshiping other gods, big into sexual immorality. There's many reasons as to why God did not want to want them to intermarry amongst the foreign nations. But that's exactly what this group of people did. And so these group of people are what came to be known as Samaritans. That's where we, we, we get the term of Samaritan. So, so they're kind of they're, they're, they're kind of like half-bloods. They, they're, they're not completely Jewish. You know, they're, they've mixed in with these other evil foreign nations. They're from uh, the ten northern tribes of Israel. We see in uh, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah the Samaritans uh, as uh, they um, were kind of opposing the work of rebuilding the, the city of Jerusalem. And so these Samaritans, they were a bunch of no good people. They, 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 were, they were wicked people. They were seen at the very bottom of the totem pole. I mean, the, the Jews, they would have rather associated with Greeks than with the Samaritans. I mean, these guys were like worse than enemies. These guys were backstabbers. They stabbed us in the back. You know, when, when you watch a TV show or a movie and, and you see someone you love stab you and, or one of the characters that you love stab you in the back, man, it just makes you so angry at that person. And, and those are the type of feelings that the Israelites would have felt towards the Samaritans. So now as we continue back into this parable of the Good Samaritan, now after the priest and Levite both pass by this man beaten on the road, now all of a sudden a Samaritan man comes along. A man who would have had zero respect from the Jewish people, a man who the Jewish people would have despised. But now what did the Samaritan do? The Samaritan, he walked down the road, he saw the man left for dead, and the Samaritan had to make a decision, just like the priest and the Levite. The Samaritan made a very different decision than the priest and Levite. The Samaritan got down on his hands and knees. And the Samaritan cleansed the wound of the man. The Samaritan man wrapped his wounds up. The Samaritan man took care of him. The Samaritan man carried him up and, and placed him on his animal. The Samaritan man, he led him to an end, and he told the innkeeper, please take care of this man. I'll give you two denarii, basically two days' worth of wages. Take this, and please take care of this beaten man. And anything else, that any extra money that you spend, I will repay you. I love this parable because it's the last person that you would expect to help this beaten man, the Samaritan man. But that is exactly what he did. He stopped all that he was doing and he went down to help the man who was beaten nearly to death. 
And so all three of these people, the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan man, they were all given a choice. They were all given a decision that they had to answer for themselves. None of them sought to do harm. Not, not the priest, not the Levite, not the Samaritan. None of them went over and said, hey, I'm going to go kick this guy in the leg because, you know, I'm feeling, I'm feeling angry at life. And, and none of them sought to do harm to this man. Now, one of them, the Samaritan man, he went and he made the, royal, the, the morally right decision, the, the, the good choice, and he went to go help the man beaten nearly to death. But the majority of the people in the story, the priests and the Levites, they did nothing. They did nothing. They turned a blind eye. They didn't do any bad. They didn't do good. They were just indifferent. They didn't care about this man who was beaten nearly to death. And man, this describes our society so well. This describes the, the nation that we are living in so well that people are indifferent. People don't care. People don't care unless it's themselves or unless it's their family or, or maybe their close friends. If it's not someone they are closely associated with, then for the most part, the majority of people do not care. And man, that hurts and it stings. This world is so dark, it's full of people who are different that don't care about other people. That's one reason as to why um, I, I don't really watch uh, the news anymore, as over and over we are reminded by the fact that we are living in a world of darkness. As a, a lot of people, they, they are doing these evil and harmful things, and we see a lot of these people just idly standing by, doing nothing. <laughs> Rather, in, in the 21st century, what do people do? They pull out their phones and they, they, they record the, the circumstances taking place at this moment because we are living in a world of indifference. Yeah, there, there, there's a lot of people who, who do harm. There's a lot of people who do evil. But for the most part, you're not going to really encounter too many people who are seeking to just cause harm and cause pain to a lot of people. They are few and far between. However, you will encounter a majority of people in our society who do not care, who are different about those around them. But let me tell you, we are called to be different. We are called to be different. We are called to be the light in the worlds of darkness. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So we are living in a world of indifference, but we are called to be the light of the world. We are called to be the light in the world of darkness. And here Jesus calls us to, to express our good works unto others. And, and through these good works that, that we demonstrate to our, our family, to our friends, to our co-workers, to our bosses, to our friends at school, towards strangers. When we express these good works unto other people, we are witnessing to the glory of God. And we can be the light of the world so that people can see the love of God in their life. So I want to encourage you all, do not turn a blind eye to the needy. Don't turn a blind eye to the hurt. We are all given a choice. We are all given a decision. Basically, there, there's three different things uh, generally. We can either do good, we can do bad, or the majority of people, they just choose to do nothing. And I want to make you guys aware of that this morning, that we have to fight the, the, this temptation to be indifferent. And we have to make the morally correct, we have to make the morally right decisions when we are encountered by them. 
It is way, way easier in life to just be indifferent, to not care, to not do anything about the people who are hurting, to not do anything about the people who are in need. But the morally right decision is to go and do good, to go and help them. As we are called to live a life full of goodness. And let me tell you, this is not the norm today. This is not the norm of the society that we are living in. Now sometimes when you go and, and you live a life of goodness, sometimes you will receive a pat on the back. And I'm happy for you if that's you. But a lot of times when we go and we live a life full of goodness and we make that morally right decision, a lot of times it will go unnoticed. But I want to encourage you to, to, to stay the course. To stay the course and live a life of goodness. And many times you will have to go against the flow of our society in order to live a life full of goodness. I think uh, back to uh, my days uh, when I was younger, when, when I was uh, a kid, um, and I was pretty timid growing up, and I would be the last person to cause harm onto someone, but I would be the first person to sit idly by and be indifferent because I was not bold enough to live a life full of goodness. And as Jesus closes out the, the, the parable in uh, Luke chapter 10, as he closes out this parable to uh, this lawyer, Jesus says, or, or, or the man said, Jesus asked, which of these three um, do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And he said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. And so we are called to do Likewise, to go and act and to, to make the morally right decision within our day-to-day -day lives. Because we are given a number of decisions within our life and we need to make the morally right decision. And there was a man uh, about 2,000 years ago uh, who knew what he needed to do. He, he was given a task, he was given a choice, he was given a decision. And now this man, 2,000 years ago, he could have done one of three things. He could have uh, chose to do the, the right thing, the good thing. He could have chose to, to seek harm, or he could have chose to do nothing. And this man's name is Jesus. And now Jesus, thank goodness, he chose to do the right thing as Jesus lived a life full of goodness. Peter says in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, that Jesus went around doing good. That, that's much of what Jesus' ministry uh, revolved around, was living a life full of goodness. And what was the payment that Jesus received for living a life full of goodness? Well, his payment was by, by having the sins of the world thrown on to his shoulder. But thank goodness that his goodness did not stop short of the cross. And through his good work on the cross, Jesus served as a witness to God and gave God glory. I'm reminded of the Roman centurion who said, Truly, this man was the Son of God, as Jesus served as a witness through his life full of goodness. And today, as we celebrate a communion, and Ben, I, I don't have a communion as well as well. Today, uh, as we remember communion, as we celebrate communion, we celebrate, we remember the life of a man who was full of goodness, who was encountered with many, 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 many decisions in, lo in life. <laughs> and, and time and time again, he chose to make the morally right decision. Thank you. And thank goodness that he made the morally right decision when he was given the choice of whether to go to the cross or not. And so today we remember that with communion. And so if you open the top, uh, you, here we have uh, the bread. And this bread represents the body of Jesus being broken for us. Let's go ahead and pray over the bread. Father, thank you for uh, the sacrifice of your son. I thank you for the example of Jesus I thank you that he made the good decision, that he was full of goodness within his life. Father, I'm sorry that uh, 
it was necessary uh, on our behalf to have Jesus sacrificed so that we can partake in the coming kingdom. But I'm sorry that you had to watch your son suffer on the cross. That he was repaid by death with his life full of goodness. Father, we're sorry, but Father, we thank you. And Father, we long for the coming of your kingdom. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's partake the bread. Similar to how the bread represents the body of Jesus being broken, this cup represents the blood of Jesus being poured out on behalf of all of us. Let's pray over the cup. Father, I thank you for the blood that was poured out for our sake, for our benefit, so that we could spend an eternity in your coming kingdom. Father, we thank you. Father, we love you. We love your son, Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Partake of the cup. Let's close with prayer. Father, we, we thank you. We love you. We thank you for the example of the Good Samaritan. We thank you for the example of Jesus. And Father, I just pray that we can follow in their example and their footsteps and that we can choose to make a morally right decision in our daily lives. Father, we love you. We long for the day when your son comes back to establish your kingdom here on earth. And so Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm so blessed to have a Heavenly Father who is good and a son who is like him. Would you please stand and we'll close to good, good father.
good father. And, and that good, good father calls each and every one of us to live a life full of goodness as well. And so I encourage you with, with the decisions that you are faced in your life, I encourage you to make the good decision, to make the morally right decision in your life. Don't sit idly by, don't be indifferent like the majority of the world, but be the light of the world.